Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Three of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee, Book Two, Chapter Three, Privileges and Exemptions. Part Three few of the privileges claimed by the inquisition gave rise to more bickering and contention than its demand that all connected with it should be exempt from all the billeting of troops and the furnishing of bagages or beasts of burden for transportation the subject is one of minor importance but it furnishes so typical an illustration of inquisitorial methods that it is worthy of examination somewhat in detail under the old monarchy, the yantar, or droit de gite, or right to free quarters, was an insufferable burden. Almost every Cortes of Leon and Castile from the twelfth century complained of it energetically, for it was exercised not only by the royal court in its incessant peregrinations, but by nobles and others who could enforce it, and it was accompanied by spoliation of every kind while the impressment of beasts of burden was an associated abuse, and even the lands of the church were not exempt. The more independent Aragonese were unwilling to submit to it, and a fuero of the Cortes of Alcañiz in 1436 provided that the courtiers and followers of the king should pay all Christians in whose houses they lodged. When the Inquisition was founded, and was to a great extent peripatetic, the officials apparently claimed free quarters, for a clause in the instructions of 1498 provides that where a tribunal was set up, they should pay for their accommodations, and provide their own beds and necessaries. When traveling, a decree of Ferdinand, October 21, 1500, repeated in 1507, 1516, 1518, 1532 and 1561, provided that they should have gratuitous lodging and beds, with food at moderate prices. The frequent repetition of this indicates that it aroused opposition and, in 1601, when the Inquisitor of Valencia was ordered to go at once on a visitation of Tortosa, he was told not to oppress the city by demanding free quarters but to lodge decently in a monastery or in the house of some official. Furnishing free quarters, however, was different from enjoying them. The old abuses gradually disappeared with the settled habitations for kings and tribunals. But the changes in military organization, with standing armies, gave rise to others which, if more occasional, were also more oppressive. The billeting of troops. When Louis the Fourteenth resorted to the Dragonades, the quartering of dragoons on Huguenot families, as an effective coercion to conversion, it shows how severe was the infliction. The rebellion of Catalonia in 1640 had for its proximate cause the outrages committed by troops quartered for the winter in places insufficient for their support culminating in their burning the churches of Rio de Arenas and Montreal. The massacre in Saragossa, December 28, 1705, of the French troops in the service of Philip V had the same origin. As the pay of Spanish armies was habitually in arrears and the commissariat system imperfect, it can be realized how valuable was the privilege of exemption from entertaining these uninvited guests and providing them with transportation when they departed. In the war with Portugal, in 1666, Galicia suffered so seriously that we are told a company of cavalry was worth to its captain two thousand ducats in ransoms from outrage. That the Inquisition should claim such exemption was to be expected, for it was one of the privileges of Hidalgos but the earliest allusion to it that I have met occurs in 1548, 
when Inquisitor General Valdez ordered that no billets must be given on houses occupied by inquisitors or officials, even though not their own or during their absence, for their clothes were in them. What authority he had to issue such a command it might be difficult to say, but it indicates that the exemption was an innovation, and, as it refers only to salaried officials, it infers that the numerous unsalaried ones were not entitled to the privilege, which is further proved by the fact that, in the Castilian Concordia of 1553, regulating the exemptions of familiars, there is no allusion to billeting. The action of Valdez, however, settled the matter as far as the salaried officials were concerned, and even the Aragonese Cortes of 1646, which greatly limited the claims of the Inquisition, admitted that they had the same privileges as Hidalgos. The determination with which this was enforced is seen in a case in 1695, when Inquisitor Sanz y Munoz of Barcelona threatened with excommunication and a fine of two hundred libras the town councillors of Malo if they should assign quarters in a country house belonging to the portero of the Inquisition, although it was occupied by a peasant who worked on the land. The councillors appealed for protection to the Audiencia, or royal court, which invited the inquisitor to settle the matter amicably in the prescribed form of the competencia, but he treated the overture with such contempt that he promptly issued a second mandate, under the same penalties, and summoned the councillors to appear before him as having incurred them. The Audiencia made another attempt at pacification to which he replied that he proposed at once to declare the councillors as publicly excommunicated. The Diputados of Catalonia thereupon protested vigorously to the king that, while all the rest of the people were patriotically united in aiding the war, and the gentry had voluntarily foregone their privilege of exemption, the officials and familiars of the Inquisition were exciting tumults and riots in their efforts to extend exemptions to those who had no claim. The chief trouble arose with the unsalaried officials, especially the multitudinous familiars, who had no claim to exemption. The Barcelona Tribunal seems to have started it, for one of the complaints made to de Soto Salazar on his visitation of 1567 was that the inquisitors forbade the quartering of soldiers in the houses of familiars, in his report, he suggested that it should be done when necessary, and the Aragonese Concordia of 1568 followed this idea by prohibiting inquisitors to support familiars in refusing to receive men assigned to them when there were no other houses to receive them. There was virtually no recognized exemption, but a steady effort to establish one, while the familiars complained that the hatred felt for them led to their being oppressed with billets when others went free. To remedy this, Philip II, in a cedula of February 21, 1576, ordered that no discrimination should be made against them, but that they should be placed on an equality with justicias and regidores, who were not called upon to furnish quarters until all other houses were occupied. Complaints continued and he advanced a step, February 22, 1579, by decreeing that for three years the towns of upwards of five hundred hearths, familiars should be exempt from billeting and furnishing transportation. In smaller towns, one half should be exempted, and where there was but one, he should be exempt. This was renewed frequently for three years at a time, and as frequently was overlooked. But this made little difference, for we are told by an experienced inquisitor that it was always assumed to be in force, and, when a familiar complained of a billet, the tribunal would issue a mandate, ordering his relief within three hours under a penalty of one hundred thousand marveides. If the exemption was in force, a copy of the cedula was included in the mandate. If it was not, 
it still was quoted as existing in the archives of the tribunal. There were few questions which gave rise to more embroilment than this. Both sides were unscrupulous. The privilege excited ill will. It was evaded by the authorities wherever possible, and the tribunals were kept busy in defending their familiars with customary violence. At length, in 1634, the necessities of the state were pleaded by Philip IV as his reason for withdrawing all exemptions, a measure which he was obliged to repeat more than once. It is somewhat remarkable, therefore, that, when the Cortes of Aragon, in 1646, succeeded in greatly abridging the privileges of familiars, they were included with the salaried officials in the exemption from billets. This did not avail them much, for we are told that, in the changes effected by the Cortes, the terror felt for the Inquisition was so greatly diminished that there was scant ceremony in imposing on its officials, that the familiars were singled out to have two or three soldiers quartered on them, and when they complained, the tribunal ventured no more than to instruct its commissioner to use persuasion. Catalonia was not so fortunate, and strife continued with its usual bitterness. As a frontier province, in wartime it was occupied with troops, and there were abundant opportunities for friction. In 1695, the diputados complained that, as the only mode of escaping billets was to become a familiar, many had themselves appointed, although there was already an innumerable multitude, and that even when the local magistrates were compelled to receive soldiers, the familiars refused, in contempt of the royal orders. The war of succession brought fresh necessities, and the change of dynasty was unfavorable to the Inquisition, in this as in so much else. A royal decree of February 11th, 1706, abolished all exemptions, but, as a favor to the Inquisition, four of its officials were accepted in towns and twenty in cities that were seats of tribunals. The Suprema accepted this cheerfully, but, when a decree of January 19th, 1712, revoked all exemptions, it remonstrated, and was told that, while the king recognized the claims of the Inquisition to all the privileges granted by his predecessors, the existing urgency required the withdrawal of all exemptions, and, as the law was absolute, he could make no exceptions. Although this covered the salaried officials, it seems to have been the familiars who complained the loudest, Possibly now that the tribunals could no longer protect them, they were exposed to special discrimination. It was a question of money, however, rather than of hardship, for a system of composition had been developed under which by paying the cuartel, or utensilio, an assessment proportioned to the wealth of the individual, the billet was escaped. When the urgency of immediate peril was passed, these decrees were either withdrawn or became obsolete. The claim of exemption revived, and with it the active efforts of the tribunals to protect those whose exemptions were disregarded, and to punish the officials who disregarded them. In 1728, Philip V made a well-intentioned attempt to relieve the oppression of the poor arising from the numerous classes of officials who claimed exemption from the common burdens, including the billeting of troops. As for the familiars, he says, who all claim exemptions and give rise to disturbances, attacks on the local magistrates with excommunications and other penalties, and perpetual competencias, all this must cease. Yet he admits their exemption, and only insists that it must be confirmed to the number allowed by the Concordia of 1553. That limitation had never been observed, and the inquisitors had appointed large numbers in excess of it, in spite of perpetual remonstrance, and Philip now ordered that tribunals should not issue certificates to more than the legal number, 
and should not take proceedings against the local magistrates. As usual, the royal orders were disregarded. The Tribunal of Valencia threatened with excommunication and fine the magistrates of Hativa and San Mateo, to the instance of some familiars on whom soldiers had been quartered, and, on learning this, Philip addressed the Suprema in 1729, stating that the records showed that familiars were entitled to no exemption. Even if they were, the tribunal had exceeded its powers in employing obstreperous methods in defiance of the royal decrees. There must be no competencia. The Valencia tribunal must be notified not to exceed its jurisdiction, and the Suprema itself must observe the royal orders. After the delay of a month, the Suprema forwarded the royal letter to the Valencia, sullenly telling the tribunal to report what could be done and not to act further without orders. For two centuries the Inquisition had been accustomed to obey or to disregard the royal decrees at its pleasure and to tyrannize over the local authorities. The habit was not easily broken, and it was hard to conform itself to the new order of things. A formulary of about 1740 contains a letter to be sent to magistrates granting billets on familiars, couched in the old, arrogant, and preemptory terms, and threatening excommunication and a fine of two hundred ducats. Familiars, it says, are not to furnish quarters and beasts of burden, except in extreme urgency, when no exemptions are permitted. And this assumes to be in accordance with the royal decrees, including the latest one of November 3rd, 1737. I can find no trace of a decree of 1737, and we may assume that it was this obstinacy of the Inquisition that induced Philip, in 1743, to reissue his decree of 1728, with an expression of regret at its inobservance and the disastrous results which had ensued. He added that, when the houses of the non-exempt were insufficient for quartering troops, they could be billeted on hidalgos and nobles. The Inquisition still adhered to its claims, but Carlos III taught it to abandon its combinatory style. When, in 1781, the authorities of Castellón de la Plana billeted troops on familiars, the Valencia Tribunal adopted the more judicious method of persuading the captain-general that they were to be classed with hidalgos and he issued orders to that effect. This did not please Carlos III, who brushed aside the claim to exemption by a preemptory order that all familiars of Castellón de la Plana should subject themselves to the local government in the matters of billets, and that there should be no charge until he should issue further commands. This would seem in principle to abrogate all claims of exemption, but Spanish tenacity still held fast to what it had claimed, and, in 1800, when José Porris, a familiar of Alcira, complained that the governor had quartered on him an officer of the regiment of Sagunto, the Valencia tribunal took measures for his relief. The times were adverse to privilege, however, and in 1805 the captain-general of Catalonia sent a circular to all the towns stating that familiars were not exempt. The magistrates accordingly compelled them to furnish quarters and beasts of burden, and, when the tribunal complained to the captain-general and adduced proofs in support of its claims, he responded with the decrees of 1729 and 1743, which he assumed to have abrogated the exemption, and he continued to coerce the familiars. The same process was going on in Valencia, and, when that tribunal applied to Barcelona for information, and learned the result, it ordered its familiars to submit under protest. Then followed a royal cedula of August twentieth, 1807, limiting strictly what exemptions were still allowed. The Napoleonic invasion supervened, and under the restoration I have met with no trace of their survival. 
Another privilege which occasioned endless debate and contention was the right of officials and familiars to bear arms, especially prohibited ones. This was a subject which, during the Middle Ages, had taxed to the utmost the civilizing efforts of legislators, while the power assumed by inquisitors to issue licenses to carry arms, in contravention of municipal statutes, was the source of no little trouble, especially in Italian cities. The necessity of restriction, for the sake of public peace, was peculiarly felt in Spain, where the popular temper and the sensitiveness as to the pundonor were especially provocative of deadly strife. It would be impossible to enumerate the endless series of decrees which succeeded each other with confusing rapidity, and the repetition of which, in every variety of form, shows conclusively how little they were regarded and how little they affected. Particular energy was directed against armas alevosas, treacherous weapons, which could be concealed about the person. In the Catalan Cortes of 1585, Philip II denounced harquebuses, firelocks, and more especially the small ones known as pistols, as unworthy the name of arms, as treacherous weapons, useless in war and provocative of murder, which had caused great damage in Catalonia and had been prohibited in his other kingdoms. They were therefore forbidden, not only to be carried but even to be possessed at home and in secret, and against this no privilege should avail, whether of the military class, or official, or familiar of the Inquisition, or by license of the king or captain-general, under penalty for those of gentle blood of two years' exile, for plebeians of two years' galley service, and for Frenchmen or Gascons of death, without power of commutation by any authority. Three palms, or twenty-seven inches of barrel, was the minimum length allowed for firearms in Catalonia, and four palms in Castile. Philip IV, in 1663, even prohibited the manufacture of pistols, and deprived of exemptions and fuero those who carried them, while as for poniards and daggers, Philip V, in 1721, threatened those who bore them with six years of presidio for nobles and six years of galleys for commoners. These specimens of multitudinous legislation directed against arms of all kinds enable us to appreciate how highly prized was the privilege of carrying them. In an age of violence it was indispensable for defense and was equally desired as affording opportunities for offense. That the Inquisition should claim it for those in its service was inevitable, and it had the excuse, at least during the earlier periods, that there was danger in the arrest and transportation of prisoners, and in the enmities which it provoked, although this latter danger was much less than it habitually claimed. The old rules, moreover, were well known, under which no local laws were allowed to interfere with such privilege and the Inquisition had scarce been established in Valencia, when the question arose through the refusal of the local authorities to allow its ministers to carry arms. Ferdinand promptly decided the matter in its favor by an order, March twenty second, 1486, that licenses should be issued to all whom the Inquisitors might name, for the time had not yet come in which the Inquisitors themselves issued licenses. Probably, complaints arose as to the abuse of the privilege for the instructions of 1498, which were principally measures of reform, provided that, in cities where bearing arms was forbidden, no official should carry them, except when accompanying an inquisitor or alguazil. As indicated by this, policy on the subject was unsettled, and it so remained for a while. November 14th, 1509, Ferdinand ordered that the ministers of the Sicilian Inquisition should not be deprived of their arms. June 2nd, 1510, he thanked the Valencia Tribunal for providing that its officials should go unarmed, for, by the grace of God, there is no one now who impedes or resists the Inquisition, 
and, if there were, the royal officials or he in person will provide for it. Then, in about three months, on October 28th, he wrote to the governor of Valencia that the salaried officials of the tribunal, with their servants and forty familiars, should enjoy all the prerogatives of the holy office, and were not to be deprived of their arms. We see in all this the traces of general popular opposition to exempting inquisitorial officials from the laws forbidding arms-bearing. This was stimulated by the difficulty of preventing the exemptions from being claimed by unauthorized persons without limit, leading Catalonia, in the Concordia of 1512, to provide that officials bearing arms could be disarmed, like other citizens, unless they could show a certificate from the tribunal, and further, that the number of familiars for the whole principality should be reduced to thirty, except in cases of necessity. Although this concordia was not observed, Inquisitor General Merceder, in his instructions of August 28, 1514, admitted the necessity of such regulations by prohibiting the issue of licenses to bear arms, by reducing the overgrown number of familiars to twenty-five in Barcelona, and ten each in Perpignan and other towns, by permitting the disarmament of those who could not exhibit certificates, and by endeavoring to check the fraud of lending these certificates, by requiring them to swear not to do so, and keeping lists whereby they could be identified. The right of arming its familiars, thus assumed by the Inquisition, was by no means uncontested. We have seen how the Empress Isabella, when in Valencia in 1524, ordered the arms taken from them and broken, leading to a protest from Inquisitor General Manrique, who asserted this to be a privilege enjoyed since the introduction of the Inquisition. In spite of this, Charles V, by a cedula of August 2nd, 1539, ordered inquisitors to prohibit the use of arms by familiars. The matter remained a subject of contest for some years more. In 1553, there were quarrels concerning it between the Valencia Tribunal and the local authorities, but the Concordia of 1554 admitted the right unreservedly. By this time, in fact, it was generally recognized, but this, in place of removing a cause of discord, only intensified and multiplied it. The right to bear arms could scarce be held to include weapons which were prohibited to all by general regulations, yet the authorities had no jurisdiction over familiars to enforce them. Thus, when flintlock harquebuses were prohibited, and the Vicery of Valencia included familiars in a proclamation on the subject, in 1562, Philip II called him to account, telling him that the order must come from the inquisitors, and, in 1575, he repeated this to the Vicery of Catalonia. The Suprema might decide that familiars were included in prohibitory decrees, and that inquisitors must issue the necessary orders as it did in 1596, with regard to one respecting daggers, and, in 1598, to one forbidding firelocks and pistols at night. But the tribunals had no police to enforce these orders, and, when the secular authorities undertook to do so, inquisitors were prompt to resent it, in their customary fashion, as a violation of the immunities of the holy office. End of Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 3